Thank you very much for joining us. I'm Robert Colville, Director of the Centre for Policy Studies and Editor-in-Chief of CAPEX. This is a combined uh, video and podcast to analyse the events of the Autumn Statement, and we're delighted to have with us someone who can analyse the events pretty well, which is uh, Richard Hughes, who's Head of the Office of Budget Responsibility. And uh, also joining us is Vicky Price, uh, who among many other roles is the former Head of the Government Economic Service and Chief Economic Advisor to CEBR. So, I mean... Richard, you've, you've published a, a voluminous um, survey of the, of the British economy to accompany and indeed in partly dictate what the, what the Chancellor announced. Um, but th that's a bit boring. Um, so let's just do this in, in one sentence or one word. How would you both summarise the state of the British economy and, and, and the public finances? Uh, so public finances broadly unchanged at the end of the autumn statement. In effect, the Chancellor was given a windfall from higher inflation um, uh, in the form of higher inflation pushing up tax revenues because the tax thresholds were frozen. Um, and that gave him a sort of cash windfall in revenue terms. And then he gave it back to taxpayers um, in the form of a, a cut in the rate of national insurance and back to business through full expensing on their investments. So that left the borrowing picture broadly unchanged compared to, compared to March. Um, and the tax take ultimately is still going up over the medium term because even what he gave back in a rate cut wasn't enough to undo you know, what we economists call fiscal drag, which is higher inflation pushing more and more people into higher tax thresholds. Um, Vicky? Well, I would say the economy is pretty flat. We've seen that in the latest uh, figures. There is a little bit of a positive sign in that consumer confidence seems to have improved just in the last month. And also we've seen some of the uh, fall in services, which were witnessed in the last couple of months in the actual output from, um, if you look at the um, Purchasing Managers Index, go up a little bit in November. That's good news, but very little growth really is, is what we're experiencing. And it's interesting that Richard spoke about what it might do to investment because of the full expensing. Um, but in fact, investment fell, business investment fell by 4.2% in the third quarter, reversing the improvement that we had seen before. It just suggests that uh, the, the any anything you do on the investment side tends to have only a temporary impact. And perhaps uh, making this new capital allowances regime permanent might change that. Whether it's going to make a huge difference overall to what companies were going to be investing on remains to be seen, but it's been generally welcomed by business. I think that's well, one we'll get into later, but that, but that point about things being flat, I mean, that's borne out by the long-term growth projections, which have been, which were already looking pretty crummy and have now been revised down, down even further. It is the case that we've been successively revising down our view of the UK's medium-term growth prospects if you look back even to my predecessor, early on, the OBR was forecasting a return to pre-financial crisis rates of productivity growth. Um, a few years ago, those were downgraded uh, somewhat. And then again, in this forecast, we reduced them further um, to reflect what we've observed, both about the shift in the demographic structure of the population toward older workers who tend to work fewer hours. That means you just get fewer hours worked across the economy as society ages. Also, the retirement rate of capital seems to be increasing, that as technological change accelerates, sort of capital becomes obsolete more quickly. That means you've got to invest more just to sort of keep the current level of effective capital stock. Um, and given that we have relatively low levels of investment, that also turns out to be a drag on productivity. So we have we have revised down uh, slightly our, our view of medium term growth prospects from around 1.8 to 1.6% on average um, in, in the long run. And one of the stories of this awesome statement, you said it's kind of, in, a, in an odd way, we're sort of, we're kind of where we are, we're kind of where we were. But there's, there, in the process of getting there, was, there were sort of, sort of enormous convulsions that appeared from the outside. So um, about, um, you know, a, a few months, at the start of October, I sat with Jeremy Hunt at the Tory party conference, and he could not have been clearer that there was not room for, for tax cuts, that uh, the, in particular the increase in borrowing costs was just relentlessly eating away, even despite this, this great tax windfall. And that didn't seem to be you know, expectation management. They were, you know, R Rishi Sunak, Jeremy Hunt, their teams, publicly and privately, were saying, look, we're really screwed here, there's not going to be tax cuts. And in the Sunday Times this week, there was a story saying, you know, three weeks or four weeks before, they were saying we, we, we're at minus 20 billion. And then by the time they stood up, they were at plus 30 billion because you guys had sent them over some, kept on sending them over better numbers. I mean, that seems like a fairly extraordinary way to be, to be making decisions if this pendulum can swing, swing that much. Uh, so, so I obviously can't comment on what kind of advice we were giving the Chancellor over successive rounds of our forecast. I think what I can say is that 
one of the challenges of operating in a high inflation environment is that two things really matter when you think about how it translates onto the public finances. One is where that inflation is coming from. Is it imported inflation or is it domestically generated inflation? And what we've seen between March and now is inflation that started out being mostly externally generated. It was driven by higher gas prices, higher food prices, which was just pushing up the price of everything in the UK, but not necessarily pushing up wages. So over time, wages starting to rise um, and not, not, not outpacing the rise in prices, but at least rising faster than we expected and other economists expected. And even what employers were saying was going to be what they gave out in, in wage, uh, wage settlements. And so inflation started becoming more domestically generated. That's a good thing for the public finances because one of the most important things we tax is wages. Um, and so if wages are rising faster, that gives you more income tax revenue, more national insurance revenue, and in particular, um, it relates to a second thing which really matters for the public finances, which is what is indexed and what is frozen from the point of view of the public finances. And one of the things which, are, which is frozen at the moment are the tax thresholds. That means that higher wage growth gives you supercharged tax revenues because you don't just get the extra increment on wages, but if someone moves into a higher tax band, you move them, you know, they start paying a higher tax rate. Other things in the public finances are obviously also indexed. Welfare benefits are indexed and debt interest has also gone up. That pushed up the price of those things. But the other thing which is not indexed in the public finances and is frozen is spending on public services. And because the Chancellor didn't change that in, in to any great degree um, in, in cash terms, that gave him that fiscal windfall that allowed him to spend some money on tax cuts in the sort of statement. Had he actually raised spending on public services in line with inflation, he wouldn't have really had any money to spend at all in the autumn statement. So it was that decision to basically not index the level of spending on public services on the health service, on education, but leave it frozen in cash terms and allow its value to be eroded in real terms that gave him the extra fiscal wiggle room to spend some money on tax cuts in this autumn yeah. statement. Uh, uh, and Vicky, um, I think you can probably answer this more than uh, <laughs> more, more than Richard, but a lot of people have been saying that this was this was effectively a column or just, you know, that, that both parties and Labour have gone along with it, that both parties are sort of accepting forecasts about public spending that as soon as the election is over, they'll have to go, actually, no, we're going to need to spend a lot more. I think it's going to be very difficult to keep to those spending promises, if you like, or the spending assumptions, because there will be a huge amount of pressure in a number of areas. Um, and we know full well that the quality of public services has been declining quite considerably. Any any poll that you you do, you ask people what they think about you know individual services, and they'll tell you that they've gone down very significantly, and that's a real problem. Pressures will be there, population is increasing, we've got these issues with migration, of course, which we're probably going to be discussing in, in a minute. Um, so the assumptions for that headroom that you were quite rightly questioning originally um, may well prove to be completely wrong in terms of what we end up with, which does unfortunately mean that if there is a, a change of government, there's going to be a huge amount of room to do anything much more than perhaps restore some of the public services but then look for cuts elsewhere. So the idea that you can really reduce income tax uh, or even do something with the thresholds, uh, which I think the Labour Party would want to do, perhaps won't be very easy at all. Yeah. And, and the other real question is inflation. The assumptions are made that inflation is going to be higher than it had been originally assumed, and hence it gives you a little bit more of a headroom because you're collecting a lot more money from taxpayers, uh, income tax and also, of course, VAT. If that proves not to be the case, if the inflation forecasts are too high, um, then that disappears. Yeah, so in an odd way, that yes, we want inflation to come down as soon as possible, but it is, it is convenient. Um, you, you mentioned migration there, and Richard, this is something I wanted to get into with you, because one of the most striking charts in the OBR's update is, about, is predicting what's going to happen to net migration, and it shows a, a peak now at around 600,000, and then coming right back down to 245,000, um, over the next few years. Um, I'm not blaming you guys for this, but there is a story here which shows just how difficult it is for you guys to make the calculations or for anyone to make calculations um, and, and how little we actually know about how many people are coming to this country. So in March, in, uh, to accompany the budget, you published a, a version of this chart which had net migration at 500,000 and then go in 21, 22 and going down to 300,000 in 22, 23. In November, six months later, you publish something which has that 300,000 as 600,000. And then a day later, literally a day later, the ONS come out and say, actually, uh, when we said for the first figure it should be 600,000, what we meant was it should be 745,000. Um, and by the way, the meanwhile, the Home Office is publishing visa figures showing that the, the next set of figures, the one which shows it kind of falling back down, is already sort of massively, you know, massively unlikely to, 
to, to be um, to hit that. So w- what on earth is going on? W- why are these three different bits of government not talking to each other? So it's been a challenge uh, to understand what's going on in the migration picture for a number of reasons. One is that we've completely changed the regime. Um, in the After we left the EU, you know, we went for a system where everybody who wanted to come here and work needed a visa. Um, so And nobody really knew how that regime was going to operate in practice. We had a reasonably good understanding of what kind of flows we got under the old regime, where you had free movement of EU citizens and visas for everybody else. Um, In the middle of it, you also had a pandemic. And so you you effectively lost a year and a half of migration. And so everyone was expecting something of a surge post post, uh, pandemic because all these people who wanted to come to the UK finally could. And then they arrived. A lot of them at time were students. Um, The third thing that happened was the Ukraine war um, and also the government's uh, 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 offer to the uh, British nationals overseas in Hong Kong, which meant that you were also going to see a further temporary surge of people coming in um, for political reasons, you know, sort of seeking asylum from the war in Ukraine um, and other places. And so there was always expected to be a temporary surge, um, and we've always expected it uh, to start to fall over the medium term and return to something which looks more like the levels of migration we had pre-pandemic, which is sort of just over just over two hundred thousand, about two hundred and forty-five thousand. I think we've been consistently surprised at the level of flows um, and how how high the peak has got to. And as you say, we revised it up. You know, we revised it up to six hundred thousand in this forecast. It looks like the latest figures say it was it was over seven hundred thousand. Um, we've also seen the government taking action to tighten up the regime. So, in between uh, our last forecast in March and this forecast, um, they removed the entitlement for students to bring in dependents into the UK. Um, that will have an effect on how many people come in. Um, and we still expect, in essence, the government to take the policy decisions necessary to bring inflation down to what they say is their objective, which is to get migration back down to something like pre-pandemic levels, which would be somewhere between 200 and 300,000. I think one thing that is sort of missing in the institutional infrastructure of the UK is that there is really no institution charged with forecasting migration. Um, you know, we need, a, we need some migration numbers to make our economic forecasts work. Um, but between the other institutions out there responsible for looking at these questions, the Home Office, the Migration Advisory Committee, the ONS, no single one institution is charged with saying, here is our best guess about where the, where, where migration is going to head over the next five years, which we could use as an input um, into our forecast. In the, in, in the end, we rely on some rather stylized projections that we get from the ONS in order to do our work. Yeah, but, but then, as I said, it, it just seems ridiculous that the ONS then lit, literally disproves those projections a day, a day after you've published. I think that they have the difficulty of, you know, you would think it's simple to count up how many people there are in the country. In, in practice, um, they rely on doing uh, surveys at, at, you know, at the airport, um, doing kind of samples of people coming in. They also have to make a judgment about how uh, likely people are to stay in the country once they've been given a visa. Um, another thing which has changed about the visa regime is that um, students are now allowed to stay after their degrees and work uh, for a period of time. So they have to make assessments about how likely it is people are to stay beyond uh, the conclusion of their courses. Um, and so that's a lot of variables to have to uh, to have to assess, um, as well as the fact that they're only sampling the population, so they've got to judge whether the samples they're taking are representative. Yeah. But I mean, you had in I mean, we were talking about this um, bit before we we started recording that um, you know the the two hundred forty five thousand long term figure comes from ONS projections from January, which in turn date from looking at data from 2020, which which has a sort of very weird thing that they, they predict that immigration, the, the figures published in January predict that immigration in the year they are being published in will fall when it was already rising and the Home Office knew knew it was rising. And, um, and meanwhile, you know, Madeleine Assumption and others who are cited in your, in your report say, actually, you know, long term, it's you know, 300,000 is more likely. And, you know, your own report has a rather pointed paragraph pointing out that um, the, the stay rate for workers as well as for students is is probably, you know, it was um, among the sort of EU migrants who could go back home quite easily. It was it, it's sort of around 27% in between 2010 and 2014, I think. And now they think that's around 57%. So it's, it, it, it does sort of seem that, yeah, there, there needs to be a, a bit more, uh, you know, the, 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 this is one area where the numbers really don't... Well, don't, one of yeah. the things that's happening, of course, is that it is quite expensive to bring people in right now uh, and the interesting thing too when you look at uh, the work visas that are being granted that the majority is going to the health service and f- the social care se- sector not really to businesses uh, and that's why you have this strange it's, problem it's, like, it's not quite a majority but it's definitely a, a huge number i think it's a huge number i thought it was but uh, perhaps it's not the majority but that's what i thought was the case in terms of i mean they may be giving the visa but in terms of who goes where it seems that the percentage is mm. quite small in terms of what happens with businesses 
that explains to a considerable extent, I think, what's happening with vacancy rates, what's happening with shortages that exist in various places, and what's happening, of course, with wage rises, which are higher than perhaps businesses had anticipated because they have to make do with whatever is around. And it is worrying, in fact, that you know we've switched the, the type of migrants who come to the ones who are likely to stay for longer, um, uh, whereas the EU ones, as we know, net migration is now zero. Uh, and businesses were able to just uh, yeah, bring so in it's, it's, instead wanted. of instead of the Polish plumber or Lithuanian yeah. coffee uh, a barista, it is the it is the an, Indi- an Indian or Bangladeshi care worker. That that seems to be the well, kind of the cliched. Um, in the, but the interesting thing is when you link it back to what the Chancellor has been trying to do, which is encouraging more investment. If you're not certain about the people, of course you might invest more in AI or you know. Um, but the idea that you can produce. The, the amount that is required with a real problem in terms of the people you, you, you can employ uh, is going to inevitably inhibit what people can do and, and therefore how investment can recover as well. And what, Im- what impact does population have on GDP uh, on GDP and, and your projections? And it was striking that you know, GDP per capita seems to have actually actually shrunk even as uh, GDP has risen. And I, I just was noodling around with the... Because I'm disinteresting. Um, last night I was noodling around... Um, while watching TV with um, the IMF and World Bank data, and it seems to show that you know if you just look at raw GDP since the Tories got in, Britain is you know, better than the euro area, better than France, better than Germany, better than Italy, better than Spain. If you look at GDP per, per capita, suddenly we shrink back down to the not to the bottom of the pack, but we you know we're suddenly back and back back on the sort of euro area average. So labour force growth has been a strong part of the UK's growth story since 2010. I mean, it's partly a story about um, having. Uh, relatively high levels of net migration. It's also been a partly a domestic success story, which I think is important not to understate. We've been better at getting more people into the workforce over that period than some other countries. That includes both young parents um, as well as as well as getting people to work uh, more years of their lives um, and, and to retire later. So, um, you know, there has been you know labour force growth has been part of the UK's growth story over the last decade and a half. I think what's been more disappointing is productivity growth, which is that people are working longer hours, um, more people are working, they're working more years of their lives, but they're not necessarily working more productively, whereas productivity growth has been more of the growth story um, in other countries over that period. Well, it's also, of course, because investment per person is considerably lower than is the case elsewhere, and, and, and that's an issue. Um, but the OBR itself, if I remember, had calculated that, in fact, migrants, at the rate anyway that we were getting before uh, the various crises that we've seen, such as the war in Ukraine or also Hong Kong, um, and at the time when we were getting a lot of EU workers in, um, they were the only part of the population that was contributing positively to finances. So they're important, not just on the productivity front, but and growth, um, if we can get the right yes. people in. But, and, also, uh, yeah. also in but, that, but that's also partly because migrants just tend to be working age, and working age people tend to actually be coming for employment. That's true. More recently, we revised down our assumption about the average employment rate of, of, of migrants to be more or less in line with the UK population. It, it used to be the case um, when our migration was dominated by the EU that they were predominantly working age, um, predominantly not bringing dependents, whereas nowadays um, a, you know, a lot of them are students, so they're not working because they're studying. Um, they are more likely to bring family members with them um, if they come from other parts of the world. And as a result, you get a sort of average employment rate um, once you weight it by the composition of migration, which is more or less in line with the, the UK domestic population. But what this means, of course, is that the contribution that migrants are going to make to the economy, except, of course, for students who are poor, and it's a major export for us, uh, is going to be a lot less in terms of growth than was the case pre-Brexit. Yes, well, although, of course, with students, there's a case that you know the universities get all the profits and then the, 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 the burden on housing and public services gets externalised to, to the state. So, but that's a, that's a separate issue. Um, I, I wanted to... Talk about a few um, more, more specific things and sort of get get your your takes on that. One of them ties it ties in Richard to what you were just saying about economic inactivity, which has obviously after the pandemic become uh, you know one of the hottest topics. Um, looking at the OBR's projections for the welfare welfare bill and welfare spending, um, you, your your projection is that over your four, five year forecast period that goes up by thirty eight percent, hundred billion pounds, um, big number. Um, is that primarily aging population? Inflation, economic inactivity. I mean, what uh, NHS uh, waiting NHS waiting lists? Like, what's what's driving that? So it's it's a mixture of things, um, and it appears to be you know partly the health of the population. Uh, you know, 
no longer improving and possibly even falling back in recent years. Um, uh, one of the things which we looked at and, and one of the people we talked to was Chris Whitty in his report on the sort of state of the, uh, the UK, of, of UK health. And as a, one of the worrying things is that we used to rely on the fact that people were spending more and more, you know, their lives were getting longer and they were getting more and more healthy years um, as they aged. Um, that, that process appears to have come to an end uh, a few years ago. And in fact, you know, people's average health is not improving um, as they get older. And so they're spending... Yeah, so life expectancy is improving, but healthy life expectancy Indeed, is, yeah. um, which is a worrying thing for the public finances because um, you know, it means that they're, you know, they're, they're more likely to fall out of the workforce and they're more likely also um, to then need the support of the health service. Um, so it's partly a health story, um, and, but it is also partly the, you know, the way in which the benefit system operates, um, which is that uh, you know, because there been, there's been such tightening up of conditionality around claiming unemployment benefit, um, what, you know, one of the few ways in which um, you can be, in, be inactive but still on benefits in the UK is to be inactive for long-term health reasons. And so um, you know, one of the reasons why uh, you know, that those caseloads appear to have risen recently um, has been basically people, people you know, trying to get out of the conditionality regimes in, in the benefit system. Um, the connection to the waiting list in the health service is less direct than you might think. Um, you know, I think we kind of, like others, started with the hypothesis that, oh, you know, is it NHS waiting lists which have also risen while inactivity rates have risen? When you actually look at the people who are on NHS waiting lists, very few of them are actually also on the incapacity benefit waiting lists. Um, and so it can't really, and also the NHS waiters tends to turn over quite quickly. You know, there's an average, there's an average wait of 15 weeks, but actually um, um, people, are, people are quite like they come off it reasonably quickly. So they can't explain why they'd be on, they'd be on inactive benefits for months. Yeah, and if, if you look at the ONS stuff, people don't seem to go straight from work into long-term sickness. There's a whole complex of That's behaviors. Right. And, and Vicky, is that, does that sound about right to you? Well, yes, and it's a serious problem because obviously you're lacking a lot of talent that could be available. Uh, and of course, it also affects you know women. I and mean, what we saw through COVID is that um, women tended and have tended to um, either reduce their hours uh, because of the pressure they were having, or now increasingly quitting uh, because of childcare costs and other issues. And that is, of course, a big, big problem for not just equality, uh, but also business being able to have the the right people there. Now, whether you can seriously, as has been assumed, I think, in the OBR, do anything by changing the uh, the system in terms of who qualifies and doesn't, how you push them into work more generally and make a big difference for the future, even though the numbers that the OBI is thinking might come back into work over a period of so time. For the, it's for, going to be yeah. very, very So small. for those who haven't been paying full attention, this is um, the, the, the um, autumn statement included measures to, to try and tackle that problem of rising disability um, waiting lists on, on the on the principle that um, both that it's the, the, the best, that work is, one, is the best cure, but also that, that there seem to be the the rise in disability seems to outstrip the sort of plausible explanation of medical diagnoses. It does, but there is one interesting uh, point that Richard made about sort of unemployment. I mean, unemployment uh, benefits are quite low by comparison to those of other countries, and you could actually tackle this issue by perhaps improving this a bit so that you can allow people to continue to look for work by being paid a reasonable amount. Uh, and I think that is one of the motivations for perhaps changing your status, and I think that could, that could be quite a significant change if that was looked at. Um, coming back to another thing which came up before, um, full expensing. Now, Vicky wrongly said that this was not uh, going to be, uh, might not make much difference. We at the CPS believe um, believe otherwise, or we we, we, we sort of think it's a sort of extremely rational thing to do, which is to stop basically punishing companies for choosing to spend their money on investment rather than on all the other things they could they could spend their money on, and and also that it's actually quite cost effective because the 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 cost falls out of the out of the budget quite quite quickly. Um, and by and you know this is uh, this this seems to be a view quite quite widely shared by lots of other can, organizations. Can I correct what you said that I don't I don't think that it isn't going to be significant. I'm just worried that it might mm. not be. In fact, all yeah. the trade bodies and industry bodies have been asking for this. Yes. So so the intention is to make it work. But yes. just the question is, will it in fact yeah. make it? Work? So that was what I was going to come on to. There's a there's a you don't hear him quoted much these days, but Ted Heath gave a fascinating speech, one of his sort of lectures at the CBI or, or its ancestral equivalent, basically saying, you know, we've given you all of the tax incentives you wanted and you, you bastards still aren't investing. Like, come on, you know, what do we have to do? This, this, is, this seems to be something quite embedded and structural within the British economy. So, I mean, well, both of you, but Richard, first, what, 
I mean, do you think full, full expensing makes a difference? And why is the British economy, why is, why is business investment in particular in the UK and, and government investment, by the way, um, so low compared to other countries? So we do think it will make uh, a difference. Um, we think that over the five years of our forecast, it raises uh, business investments in net terms by about £14 billion, so about £3 billion a year. That's about a, that's a bit over a 1% increase in the flow of business investment over our forecast. Um, you have to bear in mind that the stock of capital in the UK economy is four trillion, so fourteen billion is you know it's something, um, but it's you know, it is a drop in the ocean. Now the ocean is made up of drops, so you've got to keep dropping it in to make a difference. You, you, you might say the same about Labour's twenty eight billion uh, green investment plans. That... Uh, yeah, I mean all of these are relatively small numbers relative to what makes a difference to the economy, which is the stock of capital which you built up over decades, um, and I think it also, but it is also a challenge to. Uh, for tax incentives in isolation to make a big difference to business to levels of business investment because so much just depends on the wider environment for business investment it depends on regulation it depends on access to talent and skills um, it depends on the, the the wider financing context you know the other thing which is which has been happening in in recent years is the cost of capital going up and when we were trying to estimate what's the likely impact of this measure for expensing we, we had the benefit of the super deduction and then the temporary uh, version of, of full expensing in the recent past. And one thing which we learned was that we did tend to overestimate how much of an impact those were going to have. And I think partly because the environment in which they were operating was still very uncertain and very volatile. You had interest rates rising. Um, you had inflation going up um, faster than people expected. You had the cost of doing business going up faster than businesses expected. And you do have to take into account those wider factors when thinking about how is just one ch one change to the tax system going to affect a whole constellation of business decisions. No, oh, I, I agree with that entirely. And of course, uh, uncertainty about um, the rules, the people who make the decisions in the, uh, on the political front, the, the frequent changes we've seen um, are not particularly good in terms of investment climate. And the, there is all, always the argument that perhaps, you know, companies have just been bringing investment forward to make uh, take advantage of, of the regime that exists because it's going to change in the future. At least with the full expensing for the moment, the Labour Party says that if they come to power, they'll keep that one, and they were calling for it anyway. So at least that gives a little bit of, of certainty that way. But in addition, as you rightly said, Richard, you, you don't uh, just look at those incentives, but you look at, is the government going to be also participating more actively? And, it, and what we have seen is that there is also commitment in terms of cash, um, to invest in particular sectors of the economy. The question always is, uh, how do you pick the sectors? And, and also, why is full expensing mainly for plant and machinery? Does that disincentivize other type of investment that could take place? Yeah. Well, the, the, the obvious answer is because if you include structures and buildings, then everything it gets very, very expensive very Of quickly. course, but you can include IT. Or, uh, yeah. and, and, you know, one has to really look down now to, into the details of what... Um, what is allowed to to see whether one is entitled to take uh, you know, some some of that benefit, but one of the more important ones for the small firms is the business rate issue. And I think that's very welcome. The fact that we have a freeze again and also the the seventy five percent reduction for a while for particular sectors. Um, the question is what's going to happen in the future. That uncertainty still remains in terms of whether some of these firms will be viable and we have seen this huge increase in insolvency that's taking place which is now the worst that it's been since the financial crisis yeah although we also had a weirdly a, a complete lack of insolvencies during the pandemic yeah. as you might have well, part, yeah, partly, partly, because, kept going. partly because if you had a, pan, a company you got free money yeah. well now of course you know as richard was saying interest rates being so high uh, has a serious impact on yeah. uh, on their viability so um two final questions because we've taken up quite a lot of your, your collective time one more generally about the economy and one one about the the OBR, um, Richard. What do you, you said that you you've already kind of alluded to this that the Chancellor has you know that if, if inflation falls um, more rapidly than expected, um, that could could be could cause problems for the Chancellor. What what are the other big risks or upside or or downside things like what what is there that in 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 in, in well I'm not sure it's six months time, but um, when when he when when the Chancellor comes back to give his budget or when whoever there is the Chancellor comes back to give the next um, awesome statement. What are, what are the big things which could, could move that either either way? Are we still in this kind of, sorry to, are we still in this very uncertain time or are things just starting to kind of stabilise a bit more? I think we are still in a very uncertain time and, and the amount of money that the Chancellor set aside against his fiscal rules, sort of £14 billion worth of 
headroom is vanishingly small when you compare it to the scale of that uncertainty. And I mean, to put it into context, 14 billion pounds, it would only need a growth of 0.1 percentage point less um, over the next five years compared to our forecast um, to wipe that out. It would only take interest rates to be a quarter percentage point higher. We've seen them rise by many multiples of that over the last few months. Um, and it would only really uh, take inactivity to continue to rise rather than fall as our forecast expects uh, for that for that headroom to be wiped out. So any three of those things have been pressures and worries for, for us in putting forecasts together, and there remain huge sources of uncertainty into the future. Any, any upside? Uh, I mean, presumably, if, if growth is 0.1% higher, then suddenly uh, a, a cash, if borrowing costs go down. Indeed, you know. um, I think if we're wrong about productivity and there is a sort of productivity revolution going forward, there's lots of talk about AI and whether for a service-heavy economy like the UK, this is the thing which you know, could transform the productivity of services, which until recently have like lagged behind the productivity of manufacturing. If we can find a way of harnessing the economic potential of that, then yes, that could lead to a much higher rate of productivity going forward than we've got in our forecast. Vicky, are you, are you an optimist or a pessimist? Um, it, it all depends really on, on what happens next because there's still huge uncertainty of, of policies in the future. And uh, It's interesting on the productivity front. Um, I was very involved with all that when I was working for the government. In fact, I was in charge, would you believe it, of the productivity P, uh, PSA, which was basically the public service agreement that uh, the previous Labour government had um, had got as a way of meeting its manifesto commitments. Um, it was it was going quite well then until the financial crisis, of course. But it's really interesting how even a very small change in the productivity profile can lead to very significant upsides and downsides in terms of how much headroom there might be, and and it is very large what the difference could be. So if we were able to get that productivity to improve, that would be, I think, the, the way forward. So I'm optimistic yeah. that it's possible. I'm pessimistic as to whether we are really going to have the type of investment that's necessary to, to make that happen. And, and when you look particularly what we were discussing earlier in terms of the labour force, then uh, you, you do worry about whether that is there. So there is a serious issue uh, about what can be done um, after the next election in terms of getting the economy moving again and the OBR forecasts are pretty much in line with what most international organisations think as well um, and and that's quite depressing if that is where we end up. Um, and on the top of the OBR forecast so I mean if it feels like well I mean obviously not for the public at large but for the type of people who might be watching this or listening to this uh, the, the OBR itself has become sort of more part of the story than anyone anticipated or, 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 or perhaps thought it good. I mean, there's the issue that the uh, dynamic modelling, where the Chancellor said, the Chancellor's team said, look, we, we, we persuaded the OBR to be more dynamic, dynamic in their forecast, and suddenly the, it makes it that makes it easier to cut taxes. But there's people also talking about the, the headroom issue we, we discussed earlier. Essentially, it, it feels like, um, you know, Rachel Reeves is saying, we need a, a law to, to give give Richard Hughes more power and a, and a Mercedes, or <laughs> maybe just the more power. Uh, but, you know, and people saying that the OBR should have less power, that the OBR should have more power, that the OBR should be spun off into a sort of, uh, you should be able to do forecasts for other people. I mean, what, where, what, what is, what, 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 what's, I mean, I know you're, it's going to be hard for you to sort of make a sort of recommendation on that. But I mean, what's your sense of where that where that debate is and, and what's, what's driving that? Um, I think it's a good thing that there's a lot of focus and attention paid to economic policy making um, and, uh, and, and, and the facts um, and forecasts around it. Um, you know, we don't dictate the government's policies. We don't even advise the government on policy. And, and it is part of our legal framework to prohibit us from doing so. And so we don't have any <coughs> desire to... Uh, to do so, um, nor do we. We just do the government's forecasts for them, and we tell them whether they're on track to meet their fiscal rules. Um, the headroom number that gets so much attention. Yeah, so the, 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 I was having this debate with Jonathan Porter, and we agreed that um, that the government is the is FIFA or IFAB in sort of mm-hmm. setting out what the laws of football. And you, you're you're the you're the poor guys in in Stockley Park who are having to yeah, draw the, draw the lines. <coughs> and I mean, the government sets its own fiscal targets. We tell them whether based on our forecast, they're on track to beat them. The amount of headroom is the amount the Chancellor leaves himself uh, to meet his fiscal targets, not some, not some number um, that, that, we, that we generate. Um, I mean, on the sort of dynamic scoring debate, uh, we have always had, uh, we have always been, you know, a, an, a forecaster who does dynamic scoring, who takes account of the economic effects of policies. What we've done that in the past is we've done it more implicitly, um, you know, rather than show small numbers moving the economy forecast one way or the other, um, you know, we you know, we didn't do that 
we didn't lay out all the details of that. What we decided to do more recently is to actually lay that out much more explicitly because people are interested in these questions. They're saying, what kind of difference does you know, these labor market policies, these policies on business investment make to the labor force, the capital stock and growth? And because people are interested in those questions, we lay it out more transparently than we have in the past. And I think that probably is a good thing. Uh, you know, we, when people are curious about certain questions, we do our best you know, to the extent to our, of our sort of knowledge and powers to answer them. Vicky, I mean, I, I won't ask you to give Richard a score out of 10, but uh, where, well, do, where I, do you think? I think we absolutely need the OBR, and I know of all the criticisms that have come about, you know, we have this independent body which is telling the Chancellor what to do, which sounds uh, you know, completely wrong, since, as Richard is saying, the, the remit is set by the Chancellor and the fiscal rules. I mean, nobody's forcing them to have those fiscal rules. That's what they decided to do. Um, and, of course, there are rolling uh, fiscal rules, which actually makes it much easier for them to achieve it and, and confuses the picture frankly, if I may say so. So maybe there shouldn't be rolling. Uh, it should be at a certain point. That's what we should be achieving. Or, 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 maybe, or maybe we adopt the Gordon Brown principle of um, having them over it to, at a certain point and then changing the certain point when it looks well, like you're not going to... Well, of course. I mean, this is the similar thing which is being said about the Bank of England, which is why don't we uh, change their remit? Uh, but again, because they're, you know, they're, they are supposed to be independent, but they have a remit which is given to them by the government. And maybe they are expected to do far too much and we should reduce that. Uh, particularly, for example, they have to also take account of climate change. Yes, it makes a lot of sense in theory, but how exactly do you do this every time you change your interest rates? I don't know, but of course you can also uh, look at the financial stability side. But overall, when you're looking at the forecast, the OBR forecast and what the Chancellor has said, in my view, an awful lot depends not just on what has been said in relation to the fiscal side, but what's going to happen to interest rates, which are going to be a major issue for companies. We alluded to that before in terms of the costs. But given that inflation is coming down, and, and if your forecasts, uh, Richard, don't prove correct in the sense that we have this inflation come down faster, and this is really what the markets are anticipating, unless there is some real blow up because of what's happening in the Eastern Mediterranean, or OPEC decides to cut production. Or China invades Taiwan. Or, or China, what, what, all that sort of stuff. Um, we should really see uh, inflation stay low. In fact, we're getting near target. We don't have to meet target every year. This is a complete misconception. That's not what it says in the back of <coughs> it. It's over a period. You have to be sort of around it. Um, if interest rates can come down faster, then I would be much more hopeful about the economy. Yes, and and those, those borrowing costs would also disappear. So, it's, yeah, so it, 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 inflation coming down is, I mean, good for the, <coughs> good for the economy, bad for the Chancellor, but overall probably good uh hard to say i'm sorry to be honest <laughs> too many moving parts mm. well I mean, the interesting thing is of course what it does to debt servicing if that's what you what you yes. meant yeah, but, but also of course in terms of collection of of uh, uh, of revenues assuming of course that um those um uh, the freezes on personal allowances remain as freezes and don't get lifted because yeah, that yeah. of course then changes but, the picture uh, yeah. completely and by, by the i mean i mean the ifs has pointed out you know, if you run them for the entire six years at the moment it's looking like that's that's basically like a seven point increase in the basic rate of tax is 50, you know, 50 or billion pounds i think it's unsustainable personally. yeah and a huge amount does depend on how financial markets react to a lower inflation environment if that brings interest rates down then that alleviates the pressure on the Chancellor. If interest rates stay high but inflation falls, he doesn't get the tax revenue but he's still got the cost of servicing the high level of debt. On which optimistic note, <laughs> um, we do say and, and um, you know, all our thoughts and prayers are with the Chancellor and, the, and indeed the bond markets uh, over the next few months. Um, thank you so much to Richard Hughes. Thank you so much to Vicky Price. Um, I've been Robert Colville. Thank you for watching and listening and hopefully see you soon again.